Hello again, and this presentation is called Just Who is Evolution Good For? Is it the species, the group, the individual, or the gene? So we've all seen geese flying in formation, and that's a coordinated and presumably social behavior. The question we're asking is, what was the unit of selection in shaping that behavior? Was it because flying in formation is for the good of the species? Or is it because it's for the good of the group? Each flock benefits as a whole from flying in formation. Is it for the good of the individual? Or could we reduce it down to a gene that's been selected for? And this is called the units of selection debate. And as we'll see, this is a very contentious subject. Now, an answer uh, that might seem obvious, and which is actually pretty uh, popular right now, is that it's all of these at once. This is called multi-level selection. We're going to work slowly towards that, uh, because understanding that is not at all simple. So we just have two goals here in this presentation. First, we're going to outline the arguments about the different units of selection. And second, we're going to explain the Neo-Darwinian position that was developed in the 1960s and into the 1970s by social biologists. So let's start with the argument uh, that things happen for the good of the species. Evolution is all about the good of the species. And what's wrong with that? And on that one, we're going to kill two birds with one stone. So rather than going over arguments or criticisms of uh, for the good of the species and then for the good of the group, we're going to do them both at one time. So we're going to tackle arguments for the benefit of the species and the group at once. And this is called biological group selection. Meeting at Grand Central defines this as the idea that selection acts most strongly through the differential survival and reproduction of entire groups. And we could simply put species in there and it would be biological species selection. And as the authors of Meeting at Grand Central note, if this were common, it would be a lot easier to explain altruism and social behavior. So since it would make things easier, that sounds good. Uh, what's wrong with it? And the Neo-Darwinian position is that arguments uh, for group selection overlook selection acting within groups. So we're going to call this, just for convenience, the first Neo-Darwinian principle. We're going to outline three of these. And this first one is that the interest of individuals don't necessarily coincide, and that's whether they're of the same species or living in the same group or even members of the same family. So you recall that earlier we talked about obligate siblicide. These are very close relatives, uh, two siblings, but what Robert Trivers called parent-offspring conflict results in parents producing more offspring than they can support, and each offspring valuing its own survival highest. And that's what leads to obligate siblicide. So that's conflict within the same family, uh, much less the same species. So on the left over here, we have Boise State playing New Mexico. We have two teams in competition. And on the right, we have two quarterbacks in competition. I believe they're playing for Rutgers. So this is a key issue. This illustrates a basic issue. And that is, where should we expect selection to act most strongly? In this competition between groups or in the competition among individuals within groups? And then our neo-Darwinian position is that selection acts much more strongly among individuals within groups than it does between groups. 
Now, a possibility here, which some of you are probably considering and thinking about, uh, could it not be that the competition among individuals within those groups contributes to the success of their group against other groups? And this is uh, really obvious here, perhaps in the competition between quarterbacks. By selecting the best quarterback in competition within the group, that team has a greater likelihood of defeating other teams. And that would mean that within group competition would actually be for the good of the group. So that seems like a reasonable argument. But the Neo-Darwinians point out that this makes a very big assumption. And this is that the qualities that contribute to individual success within groups, like who's the best quarterback, are actually good for the group. So maybe our example of sports team is poorly chosen. How else could we frame this? So the issue here is what if what is good for the group does not coincide with what is best for or good for the individual? And an example of this is what are called public goods. So if something's a public good, it's open to everyone including those who contribute nothing uh, to provisioning that good. And an excellent example of this would be private roads. Obviously, our public roads are also public goods, but there's this coercive taxation system that makes us all pay our share at the gas pump and at our property tax bill. However, if it's a private road, it can be quite difficult uh, for those who live further down the road to get those further up the road to pay their share. So what I'm saying here is that if you're, say, two miles in on a private road and you want to improve that road, in order to improve that road to your house, which is at the end of the road, you have to improve the road past everybody else's house along the way. What if they don't want to contribute? They say, I only have to drive 100 yards to my house. Why should I pay for the new road? So this we're going to call the second Neo-Darwinian principle. What is best for the individual is not necessarily coincident with what is best for the group. And here's another example of this. We've all experienced this. Uh, you're driving down the interstate and you see this sign. It says left lane closed ahead. And so you know that what you're supposed to do is be merging to the right. But that right lane is backing up with the cars and slowing down. Everybody's merging, and that opens up that left lane. So you have this dilemma, right? What should you do? Should you move civically to the right and take your position in line? Or should you rush up the left as far as you can and see how many other drivers you can get ahead of and in doing that make them very angry. So this is an example of self-interest conflicting with the group benefit. If you cut ahead on the left, you benefit. You're a cheater, but you get ahead and you get where you're going a little more quickly than everybody who just gets in line. Obviously, this is going to work best uh, when very few individuals cheat. So if everyone does this and starts moving to the left and trying to get ahead, very quickly traffic just comes to a stop and then everyone's especially mad. We're uh, at, a, at a standstill. Now if you merge to the right, the group as a whole benefits. Traffic flows more smoothly and everybody gets where they're going more quickly. But you pay a penalty because you're not as far up in the line as you might be. And with each car that actually merges to the right, the payoff to cheating goes up. And by that, we can see that more road opens up and it's possible to go further towards the front. So this is an interesting uh, social dilemma here. So a question arises, well, can group benefits ever evolve when they run contrary to individual interest? Yeah. Another way to put this is, is it likely that benefits at the group level will outweigh the benefits gained at the individual level. But the neo-Darwinian argument is that this happens only rarely, and generally selection operates at the level of individuals. 
Now we might wonder, well, how do we know that? Or what's the argument here? But the argument of neo-Darwinians is based on two observations. This question, where will selection act most forcefully? Will that be between groups and competition, or will it be among individuals within groups? So what's the likelihood that a group will become extinct or fail to reproduce? And Darwinians argue that this is relatively low, particularly if we're talking about whole species. Species do become extinct, but they do this at a much lower frequency than individuals who die and fail to reproduce. So the likelihood of an individual failing to reproduce or dying is much higher than the likelihood of a group becoming extinct and failing to reproduce. That's the premise of the argument here. And that means that selection is going to be much more direct and operating at a much faster pace among the individuals within groups than between groups. A second point, and this applies quite forcefully to humans, is that genetic variation between groups is generally low relative to the variation within groups. And if we look at that from the perspective of individuals, we can say that the genetic variation between individuals within a group is high relative to the variation between groups. And this is almost always the case uh, when we're comparing groups within a species. It's certainly the case for humans. So the genetic variation between different groups of humans is quite low compared to the variation among the individuals within those groups. And we'll try to come back and talk about that more uh, at a later time. So the neo-Darwinian argument then, the third neo-Darwinian principle, is that adaptation should be attributed to no higher level of organization than is demanded by the evidence. And this is a quote from, uh, from Meeting at Grand Central, page 36 from George Williams, uh, who helped formulate the Neo-Darwinian principle. So this raises a question, if we're trying to go as low as possible in terms of the hierarchy of life, just how low can we go? And this is some really impressive uh, limboing. Uh, evidently, that's in Dublin in Ireland, uh, much lower than I can go. So how low can we go? Can we go below the individual? And ultra-Darwinism, as it came to be called, takes the genes eye view of selection. And the logic here is based on Hamilton's principle of inclusive fitness. You'll recall that in order to even think about inclusive fitness, we have to think about shared genes. And in focusing on shared genes and their transmission, we shift away from the individual as a unit of selection and we come to see that it's only our genes that survive and reproduce. And this is the position then that Richard Dawkins famously developed in his book, The Selfish Gene. It really wasn't about selfishness at the genetic level so much as it was an argument that the proper level to focus on in understanding selection wasn't the individual, but at a lower, even more fundamental than the individual at the level of the gene. So here's where we started out. Is selection operating for the good of the species? The neo-Darwinian argument is no, it isn't. Is it acting for the good of the group? Again, the neo-Darwinian argument is no, it isn't. Is it for the good of the individual? And that's a strongly embraced by neo-Darwinians. And is it for the good of the gene? And again, uh, that became a popular argument. So this is the units of selection debate. It's certainly not over. It remains a contentious subject and we'll be coming back to the question of group selection and more recent defenses of that position. And also to the idea of multi-level selection, which hopefully you can begin to see now that although that's an obvious answer that all units at once are selected on, it's not at all a simple thing uh, to defend. Thank you for listening.